side of fame with Piers Morgan, now at 10.50. Right now on BBC One, Crime Watch. Tonight on Crime Watch, the attacker who stopped mid-assault to ask his victim for a cup of coffee. Who is he? Hi there. If you can name that man who took a coffee break during his attack, then you need to get in touch. We'll have more on him later. We are live, and hopefully by the time we come off air, we'll be closer to catching him and all the others that we are after tonight. They include the masked gang who took on a garage in Merseyside with a sawn-off shotgun. Here's what happened. Really horrific scene. Well, Jim Stanton was shot twice. He died later that evening. Who killed him? Why did they kill him? And as usual, Rav is here. Evening, Rav. Good evening. Tonight, I'm after this bloke who's using a stolen bank card to withdraw money. Now, we get a really nice close-up of him. Here it is, thanks to Cash Point Cam. But who is he? And Matthew is here, evening Matthew, with a case called, believe it or not, folks, the Pasta Poisoner. Tell us more. Yeah, it's an extraordinary case of Heather Mook, who poisoned her own husband. Now, she laced his food with uh, rat poison and drugs. He did survive, but only just. Yeah, an in-depth report coming up on that later. Thanks, Matthew. But first, we desperately need to find the man who posed as a policeman to rob this woman, Margaret Breers. At 82, she was a vulnerable and very easy target. What she suffered was appalling. All for just 16 quid. We've got to solve this. So watch closely, and if you can help us, call us. Here's what happened. Police. There's an intruder in your back garden. Give me £10 and I won't hurt you. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, oh. <laughs> please don't hurt me. I'm 83. Please don't hurt me. Margaret Breers was left on the floor, where she was forced to remain all night. She suffered a fractured hip as a result of the attack and was unable to raise the alarm as the offender had removed her emergency pendant from round her neck and had also unplugged the telephone. in that way. Everywhere was locked up. The curtains were shut, so I just panicked. Because it wasn't normal. Mum? Curtains are closed. I went round to the front thinking I'd knock on the window. The door was open. Mum? Mum? Oh, Mum! What have you done? Everything was like slow motion. I was trying to phone the ambulance and I couldn't think what number to dial. And then I tried to dial and couldn't get through, but the phone had been unplugged. Before he went, he could have given her that curline back. 
He could have plugged a phone in. He could have even rang 999 from a phone box. He could have done anything, but he didn't. He left her for 12 hours on the floor in pain, cold, alone, and with the door open. And don't forget, it was March. Margaret was taken to hospital and amazingly provided us with a full statement of events. She was the only witness to this crime, and as such, that's a crucial piece of evidence for us. And as is normal in these circumstances, we were able to capture that on tape. Okay. Shall I give you ten pounds? And I'll let you go. Right. Okay. And that's when he threw you onto the floor. Yeah. Margaret was even able to help us put together an e-fit of the offender. Do you know how tall he was? Oh, about five foot eight. Five foot eight, five foot ten. Okay. When all this was going on, Margaret, how did you feel? Useless. Useless. But when she said, she'd said to him, I'm 82, nearly 83 years of age, you can't leave me like this. I just, it makes you feel sick. I said, please don't hurt me. I'm nearly 83. Please don't hurt me. They give me a shove. That was it. It's the first thing in your mind when you wake up and the last thing in your mind when you go to bed. I just, just want him caught. The pathologist who examined Margaret's body said she died as a result of her injuries, which now makes this a manslaughter inquiry. And this is all she died for. 16 pounds. I think we all feel that somebody out there knows who did this to our mum. Somebody knows who that person is. And maybe they're frightened of coming forward. I don't know, but I'll bet one thing, they're nowhere near as scared as our mum was that night. She must have been terrified, absolutely terrified. So sickening. I am joined by DI Chris Sefton. This is appalling, isn't it? What a state of affairs. Um, what sort of lady was Margaret? Well, Margaret was a, a St. Helens lady, born and bred. Um, she, she was a lovely lady. She was 82. She was the mother of six, grandmother of 15, and a great-grandmother of, of 24, and her family loved her very much. I'm sure. Do, do you think she was specifically targeted? I do think she was specifically targeted. Um, it was quite obvious that Margaret lived there alone. Um, it's the type of accommodation that is obviously um, an elderly person's accommodation, right. and I think this individual did target her, yes. I suppose there's every chance that this man doesn't necessarily know that Margaret died. If he's watching tonight, what would you say to him? I would ask him to, uh, to hand himself in, to ring the police and contact us. We'll deal with him professionally and courteously, as always. Uh, this family needs some closure and they can't begin the healing process until somebody is identified for this. As we saw in the six days that Margaret was in hospital, you were able to speak to her. What do we know about her attacker? Well, her attacker was a white male uh, with a local St Helens accent. He was 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10 inches tall um, and he was aged between 30 and 35. Margaret was able to tell us that he had a distinctive mouth. Um, she didn't say much other than that, but she said it was unusual in some way. Now, Chris, let's take a look at this thing here. This is the money tin. This is really important. It is. That's a crucial piece of evidence. That, that is the only, the only thing that was stolen from the house. It had £16 pounds inside it. And what I would say to anybody, anybody who's seen one of these, please ring the police and tell us where you've seen it, either discarded or in somebody's house. Please ring us and we'll investigate every call. OK, you're treating this as manslaughter? We are, yes, very seriously, yeah. OK, thanks very much Thank for now, Chris. If you can help, then, the number's up on the screen. Or you could call the independent charity Crime Stoppers. Let me give you the number for that. It's 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Indeed, they have put up a £5,000 reward for information leading to a conviction. If you need to see that reconstruction again, it's on our website. Let me give you the address, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now, here's Rav with some villains caught on camera. Right, here we go. Watch closely, and if anyone looks familiar, then get on the phone. One man, four robberies. 
All on the same bookies in London's West End last year. Always the same time of night. Always armed with a gun. Always threatens staff and demands cash. He's tried a variety of disguises. Sometimes the hoodie, sometimes the flat cap and shades. But he never leaves home without a trusty bandana. After the stick up, he lets his guard down. Nice one, mate. He thinks he's got away with it. Prove him wrong. Name, please. It's February, and this pair look harmless enough, buying fags from Londis in Ashton in Makerfield, near Wigan. He empties his pockets, looking for change, and they have a laugh with a cashier. But police believe they're just killing time. They're wanted for an arson attack on a minibus just outside moments later. After yet more bumbling around, it's finally time to leave. Who are they? A cash machine outside Tesco's in Prescott, Merseyside in May, and these men are using a stolen card. It was nicked from a house a couple of miles away a few hours earlier. Want to take a closer look? We can, thanks to Cashpoint Cam. Sneaky. Take a good look and give us a name. A normal Saturday night out at the Destiny Club Newcastle in June. There's dancing and drinking and everyone's having a good time until the man in the white lashes out for no reason. With the victim on the floor, the attacker comes at him again, throwing a bottle at his head, severing a blood vessel. A mindless outburst of violence. Then he calmly walks away. How long before he does it again? Who is he? Think you know anyone? Well, call us here in the studio, the number's on your screen now. Or remember, you can text us on 63399, just type crime, space, and then your message. It's really important to leave that space or your message won't get through. Now, if you need a second look at tonight's CCTV, it is on our website. Indeed, all the CCTV we feature stays there until the case gets solved. It's worth a look in case you've missed any from previous programmes. The address, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Still ahead, can you name the control freak who forced a pregnant woman to feed him? It is a bizarre case. I'll be joined by one of the country's leading criminal profilers to shed light on the man we're after. And the incredible story of how police caught this woman, the so-called pasta poisoner. There she is. She stole over £40,000 from her frail mother-in-law and tried to cover her tracks by poisoning her husband. She used a combination of drugs and rat poison hidden in his pasta. Her husband, John, survived. He'll describe his ordeal a little later in the programme. And I've been to Birmingham on the hunt for the killer of this man, Patrick Mellard. He was stabbed in the back in his local park. Someone watching will know who did it. Now, imagine getting a call to say that your husband's been shot at work. It's almost unthinkable, but that's just what happened to Jean Stanton. Her husband, Jim, worked in a busy office in Aintree in Liverpool. Two gunmen pulled up outside. They went in and opened fire. Two years on, and the family desperately needs answers. Here's what we know. Jim, he worked as a sales manager. Um, he's always, always worked hard since the minute I met him. We met when I was 16, and he's never been out of work all, all, his, all his, his adult life. Through the day, um, I spoke to him, which I would normally do. I'd speak to him a few times through the day and work. What are you doing for tea? Well, I didn't think that was going to be the last time. People do say to me that, oh, well, Jim was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I said, no, 
he was in the right place because that's where he was behind his desk working. When you finish that, can you do the white one? Because he's coming in half an hour, and that's a priority. Is that all right? OK, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Yeah, we're winding up now. Yeah, I'm hoping to be on with all six. Boss had turned up. They were having a chit-chat, and I knew Jim would be getting impatient because he'd like to lock up. Come on, lads. Get a move on. I don't want to be here all night. But if they'd have got off when they did, the garage would have been locked up and Jim wouldn't have been there. Can I help? What size? The other men could see it coming and ran off in different directions. But because my husband was sat behind his desk and tried, obviously it was too late. I think he took the... leave work around about probably quarter to six. He would lock up the garage, usually six, six o'clock, ten to six. He would phone me on my way home and say he was, he was off to the gym where I'd phone him. But that day when the phone rang, it wasn't Jim, it was... It was for someone to say to, to get home quick. about it all the time. I wouldn't call them people. They're not humans. They're not humans at all. The family just needs a closure to this, to put the people where they should be who've done this, take them off the streets. I know it's not going to bring Jim back, but I'm sure it would help for us to move forward a bit. It's just the pain's unbearable sometimes. So sad. I'm joined by DCI Dave Brunskill, who's heading up the investigation. Um, do you think it was the case that Jim was, was targeted as an individual here? It's unclear who the intended target was. What we can say is the gunman indiscriminately entered the premises and shot in the direction of all of the occupants of the garage at the time. Um, it was clearly a planned and targeted attack. And it's incredible that nobody else was killed or seriously yeah, injured. That's for sure. So if they were targeting the business, any idea why they might have been targeting the business? No, that's clearly what I'd like to establish is what was the motive? Who were the offenders who were actually responsible for carrying it out and who was the person behind it? Yeah, do you think the people who carried it out were local? Might they have spoken about it? I believe they may well have been. Uh, clearly they may well have spoken to local people. There'd clearly been a degree of planning in relation to the attack on their premises. Dave, we've got two cars here. Yeah. Tell me first of all about the getaway car. Yes, that was a Toyota Aventus. It originally bore the registration number DA53MKK. Now, that vehicle was stolen approximately two months before the attack on the premises, and I'm keen to know where that vehicle was, who sold it on, or who it was passed on to. We saw in our reconstruction that car was dumped on the night, it was set on fire. That's right. There's then a link to another vehicle. Tell us about that. Yes, well, the vehicle, the Aventus, was dumped in Blindfoot Road 
in the rural area of Rainford uh, near St Helens and it was set on fire. Now we believe possibly a uh, black Vauxhall Vectra bearing the registration number KN53YHL may have been connected with the burning out of that vehicle. Certainly 15 minutes after it had been burned and set on fire, that vehicle was sighted in the Lathan Road area of Highton and we're keen to trace the occupants of that vehicle. Right, and now details on the website if people need more details. That's right. Briefly, there's a big reward here, very briefly. There is. The Merseyside Police have put forward a reward of £20,000 for information which leads to the arrest and conviction of those responsible, either directly or indirectly. OK, thanks very much for coming in to talk to us about this. If you can help, there's the number. Do call, it's on the screen now. Here's Rav with some of the UK's most wanted. Right, you know the score. See anyone you recognise and then give us a call. These four are wanted in connection with the kidnap of a lorry driver in North Yorkshire back in 2006. He was held at knife point and driven to Merseyside before his load was stolen and the truck torched. They're all originally from Liverpool, but if you know where they're hiding tonight, now's the time to call. Number one is Alan Barr. He's 25 and 5 foot 9. Number two is James Healy. He's also 25 and a big Liverpool fan. Number three is Neil Murphy. He's 5'11 and known to have worked as a security guard. And lastly, number four is Darren O'Flaherty. And he's 34 and 6 foot 2. If you can help, don't wait. Phone or text now. The number's on your screen. And these mugshots are also on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. You know, it really is worth taking a look at our website. We now have a range of web appeals. Those are additional cases that you might be able to help solve online. We've got more wanted faces and, of course, all of tonight's reconstructions, tonight's CCTV. If you want to keep across all of the developments on Crime Watch cases, the arrests, police breakthroughs, what's coming up, then you can register for the Crime Watch newsletter. Loads of you have already signed up for that. It's free. We'll email it to you roughly about once a month. All you need to do is register online, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Our next case, I have to say, is one of the most bizarre that we have ever featured. On the face of it, we don't have much to go on. There's no e-fit, there's very little in the way of forensic evidence. What we do have, though, is some very unusual and distinctive behaviour. Hopefully, this is going to strike a familiar chord. It may be someone that you know. Now, the victim was seven months pregnant. She has bra bra bravely, rather, agreed to describe her ordeal. Here is what happened. I was just kind of begging. I said, just take anything, just leave me. I, I, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to do anything. No one will know what's happening. Please don't hurt me, just take whatever you want. Please. Just take whatever you want and leave me. I'm not going to tell anybody. Who's this? My sister. Your sister? Who are these? My, my family. Your family? Hmm. Where are your neighbours? I don't know. Please, please don't hurt me. I'm pregnant. Please leave me alone. Who lives downstairs? A girl. Is she fit? Has she got a good body? I don't know. Does she look like you? Please, please don't hurt me. I'm pregnant. Who's this young man here then? Help! Come here. <laughs> Come here. Can you help me? Get back here. Oh. Oh. You don't have to be frightened. Oh. I, I was nearly 
there. But he just grabbed my hair. Now listen, you are making me very frustrated. Come back in here now. now come in here. That's right. Kneel down there. That's it. Don't worry. Please, please don't hurt me. It's not going to be painful. Oh, no, no. Please, don't no. Don't be afraid. Please don't hurt me. you got a nice body. At that point, he started to touch me. He said, oh, you have a nice breast. I'm sure you have a nice legs. I start to cry. I start begging him. I can't describe how I felt. The feeling I won't wish to anyone to feel. I thought he is going to, to rape me. I'm going to start at your wrist. Please, don't hurt me. I'm going to work down to your knees. And then I'm going to put cocaine up your ass. But first, go and get me a cup of coffee. I just couldn't move at that time, you know, when you're... I just... I couldn't feel even my body. I couldn't feel my skin, nothing. I... I can't move. I said, go and get me a cup of coffee. <laughs> nice ring. Uh, no. Feed me with it. Feed me with it. On second thoughts, put it back on the table. When I saw the knife, I thought he's going to kill me. What? I just felt so relieved by people around me. You just feel you are safe. It's a good feeling. Well, there is a little bit of good news in this story. The young lady there, the victim, went to full term with her pregnancy. In fact, she went into labour just this afternoon. We will keep you updated on the progress of that. I'm joined now, though, by Dr Donna Young. She's an expert in offender profiling. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us. An opportunist, do you think, or somebody who'd meticulously planned this? I think this offender is taken aback to find himself in this situation with this complete control over the young victim. Yeah, right. So not at all planned. In fact, it takes a while for the, the cruel advantage he could take of this situation to fully dawn on him. What do you make of, we saw in the reconstruction there, I mean, he, he was smiling, apparently, clearly, visibly enjoying what was going on. Well, you see, the offender here isn't seeing this situation as you or I would, or indeed as the victim was experiencing it. He's completely focused on his desires and the opportunity this is affording him to fulfill them. This is where the bizarre, apparently bizarre behavior right. comes in, the smiling, the discussion of the photographs. Incredibly, he thinks that he's engaging personally with the victim. He's justifying the whole event in his head as some kind of social encounter. What about the control? What about the fear? Are those important factors for him? Um, certainly, as a result of this event, he is likely to have become the kind of individual that enjoys the control and the fear. Um, I have no doubt that, that this episode, this event, figures as a very significant occurrence in his internal world now. And these sudden changes of gear, the, I want a cup of coffee, and then, bizarrely, feed me the coffee. Well, I, he, I, this is an individual with a very serious drug addiction, um, so it may be a, partly a result of that. But I think the, the coffee is actually about him trying to normalise the situation, to make it fit the way he's seeing it. But at the same time, he remains a very serious criminal who switches again then into professional mode and becomes forensically aware. So the combination, we get this bizarre ritual with the coffee. And what about the bizarre and very unsavoury language? We very deliberately included that there, the cocaine up the arse phrase. That, that, that could actually be very important. I think the language is significant in its clumsiness. 
Um, it, it shows a lack of any rehearsal of any pre-offence fantasy, suggesting that this is someone who hasn't done the sexual component of this before. Right. It's also revealing in uh, the extent to which this, this is a serious drug addict. And what about people watching? I mean, what elements of this could they put together to think whether or not this is somebody they know? What are the important bits? Uh, as well as being a serious drug addict, somebody with a serious drug addiction, um, this is clearly an individual with a lengthy criminal history, particularly right. for burglary, uh, spanning back 15, 20 years. Um, it, he may or may not have a partner. He may not because he may have just come out of prison at the moment, but he certainly has had relationships in the past. And I think in the context of those, he would not necessarily have appeared particularly abnormal. Ah. Now, it, the police are looking at him in connection with uh, another attack. Is it likely he's going to attack again? Uh, well, offenders learn from experience, adapt and develop. And certainly, I think that this event will have had a big impact on, on him and on what he will now be prepared to go on and do. Yes, what about that? Very briefly, the knife. Um, the knife... Uh, People who stay a long time with their victims are often the most dangerous, so I think yeah. it is possible that he will use the knife in future offences. Donna, it's always fascinating to talk to you. Thank you very much for filling us in on all of that. Let's just recap. Let's recap on what we know about this man. He is over six foot tall. He's a medium-skinned black male with a London accent. We think that he's got this seven centimetre long scar probably on his left cheek. He was wearing a distinctive red body warmer. If you can help, then the number's right there on the screen. Or you could call the independent charity Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 555 one. If you've been a victim of crime, that is the victim support line. They are on 0845 30 30 900. Now here's Rav with more faces in the frame. Police have made a number of arrests as a direct result of last month's programme. But let's hope we do just as well tonight with this next lot. Number five is David Brooks. And police want to talk to him in connection with the murder of Robert Spence. Robert died after being stabbed in a fight in Reading Town Centre back in May. Brooks is 33 and originally from St Paul's in Bristol. Wayne Holden is my number six and City of London police want to speak to him about a series of office burglaries. 18 in fact in the last three months. He's six foot from West Bromwich in Birmingham and is known to take the National Express to London, Victoria. The last sighting of him was in Taunton, Somerset. But where is he tonight? Now, number seven is Abdi Shakur Gakal, and he was found guilty of robbing a news agency in Birmingham back in January. He was bailed before sentencing, and he's now on the run. He's originally from Somalia and also calls himself Abdi Rashid Hale, and has got links to West London and Saltley in Birmingham. And finally, my number eight is Omar Deep Singh and he's wanted in connection with the rape of a 15-year-old girl in Gravesend in May. He's 24 and has previously worked on building sites in Kent, Glasgow, Manchester, Cambridgeshire and Milton Keynes. But he may be known as Bal or Bally. So call us here in the studio, the number's there on your screen, or remember you can text us on 63399, just type crime, space and then your message. And it's really important to leave that space or your message won't get through. Uh, let me tell you, we've already had, on the Margaret Breer's case, that was the old lady, the 82-year-old, who was kicked over, attacked, and left for as good as dead in her own home. We've had 10 calls on that with 10 different names, all very interesting. Back in September last year, we featured the murder of little Rhys Jones. He was shot as he made his way home from football practice. Seven people are currently standing trial on various charges in Liverpool. We're going to bring you more on that as soon as we can. Now, last month, we appealed on a very gruesome double murder of a young Chinese couple tortured in the Newcastle flat. Detective Superintendent Steve Wade asked for your help to catch the killers. There are over 100 police officers working on this investigation, painstakingly going through the evidence, and this is what we believe may have happened. Oh, don't forget the gas bill. Mm. Ken. Do you want anything special tonight? Um, oh, the beef you made last week. You like it, yeah? Bye-bye. <gasps> Bye. Sissy worked in Wagga Mama's restaurant in Newcastle City Centre. She left at 3.40pm. She took a bus the short distance to Stanhope Street. Where she got off the bus, it would have taken her no more than a minute to walk home. So we now know that she got into her front door around about 4 p.m. Kevin! <laughs> Give
given that there were two weapons used in this offence, given the gratuitous nature of the violence, given that the couple were separated in two separate bedrooms, I am convinced that there would be two or more offenders involved in this killing. I believe the killers entered and left via this front door shortly after 4 p.m. They must have been wearing either bloodstained clothing, or if they weren't, they must have put that bloodstained clothing into some bags. At 5 p.m. that day, three people were standing right outside of the gate. Were they the murderers, or were they simply passers-by? Well, as a result of our appeal, two new witnesses have come forward who saw those three men loitering outside that flat. That was on the afternoon of the murders. We now have this new EFIT of one of them. Who is he? Police also need to hear from a man who called the instant room. He left a message saying that he had crucial information. If that was you, police do need you to call back. There are Cantonese and Mandarin versions of the appeal on our website, bbc.co dot uk slash crime watch now next we need your help with the murder of patrick mellard he was stabbed in the back in his local park rav's been on the case in birmingham what happened in this park in may is baffling a fight broke out between two men and one of them patrick mellard ended up dead patrick was 33 and the youngest of 10 children he lived in balsall heath in birmingham with his mother. Perhaps you can start by telling us what sort of person Patrick was. <laughs> Patrick was my son. Um, he was very quiet. And um, he was, um, he was, not a, he was a kind-hearted person, you know. Um, he loves to help people. If I'm doing something and it's not doing right, he will say, give it me. <laughs> Give it me, that's not how you do it. <laughs> so where had Patrick been on the day he died? We think he had a job interview in the morning. Later on, he appeared on CCTV when visiting friends in the Highgate area of the city. Around six o'clock, he was heading towards home. But by the time he reached this park, things took a dramatic turn. It was pouring with rain, yet there were lots of people out and about. Police have pieced together what they saw. Witnesses spotted two blokes having a row near Orchard Way. One of them fits Patrick's description, but was it him? Minutes later, another witness saw two men fighting here, just metres from where the argument took place. They squared up to each other and blows were exchanged. It was a nasty scene, but it was about to get much worse. Patrick was violently stabbed in the back. He didn't stand a chance, and 45 minutes later, he died. The next we know, a man was seen rushing away from the area, holding a knife. He ran towards the south side of the park. Who is he, and where was he fleeing to? The officer came to the door and he said, um, I'm afraid I've got um, bad news for you. And I said, is it Patrick? And he said, yes. And I don't know why I asked the question. I said, is he dead? And she said, yes. She went to the coroner's office and I saw him and I, um, <laughs> I was, when I saw him, I wasn't convinced that he was dead. I thought he was just lying down there. And I, I, I tried to call him to see, <laughs> to see if he would um, respond in any way, but he, he, he couldn't, he was just there. I, I, I just prayed. It wasn't him, but it was him. Oh, it was him. Police simply don't know why someone would want to kill Patrick. It's a question that continues to haunt his family. Leonie, if someone was watching this at home who does have any information mm -hmm. on what happened to Patrick, mm -hmm. what would you say to them right now? Anything they see or they know, it would be a help. Ring up or say what they see or what they hear. That would help, you know. It, it would be a big relief to us. And with me now is DI Neil Corrigan. That was both brutal and cowardly. 
but what are your thoughts on the motive? Well, we don't know why Patrick was attacked in such a violent way. He's described as a quiet man who kept himself to himself. He lived at home with his mother, and we're not aware of any enemies that he had. Well, we know that a fight took place, and you think one of the people may well have been Patrick, but what else do you know about that? Witnesses will tell us that two men had an argument near Orchard Way. Um, they're described as having an argument which then broke into a fight. Uh, we're keen to trace anyone that saw anything around that time. Now, we've both met Patrick's brave mother, who's urging any witnesses to come forward. How important are outstanding witnesses to you in this case? We're keen to hear from anybody who has any information. We can see how brave Leone has been. I'm confident that people in the local community have some information. I ask them to examine their conscience and be as brave as Leone, come forward, do the right thing and help the police. You mentioned the local community. Do you think that this guy, the attacker, is actually from the locality himself? We believe that he was on foot. There's no mention of a vehicle that we know of. Uh, we believe that he knew Patrick. We don't think this was a stranger attack. So we would tend to support that he has some knowledge or links to the local area. And I know you don't have stacks to go on, but describe again to us the person that you're after. The person we believe responsible is described as a dark-skinned Afro-Caribbean male. He's about five foot seven tall and was wearing all dark clothing. He's described as having short, black, cropped hair. Brilliant, Neil. Thank you very much. The number's there on your screen. Call or text now if you can help. Now, it's taken two crime watch appeals and a police investigation lasting 11 years to catch this man. He is David Newson. His most recent attack was on Ilkley Moor in West Yorkshire. Here's what he did. You've got a lot of energy today, haven't you? Playful little thing, isn't he? Yeah, too playful. Lily, come on. I'd never seen him before, and I didn't like the way he was looking at me. Come on, we've got to get going. Come on, come on. got hold of the blade with my hand and managed to stop him uh, cutting my throat. <laughs> well, what do you want? I've got a watch, have my watch. No, I don't want your watch. <laughs> I could feel something going round my neck and I thought, I'm dying now. I'm going to die. And I'm never going to see anybody again. It is incredible that she survived that ordeal, a testament to her courage and bravery. Last week, David Newton held his hands up and admitted it. He also admitted the rape of a young girl and the abduction of her brother. That happened nine years earlier. He'll be sentenced next week. Police, however, feel his list of crimes may not end there. He used to work as a delivery driver up and down the country, specifically, though, in Devon and Cornwall. Take a good look if you think that you have been one of his victims, then do call us now. And developments on a case we featured back in June, the murder of the farmer Patrick Devine. He was killed just as he was about to have dinner at his home in Claudy in Northern Ireland. Here's what happened. Patrick was shot a total of nine times. A 52-year-old man has now been arrested in connection with the attack, but police were well, there still keen to hear from anyone with information about the killers. If that's you, please pick up the phone. Now, this isn't a typical crime watch case, but it's something police desperately need your help with. This is Mary McCann. She's gone missing with her two-year-old daughter, Anna. Anna was being cared for by a foster family in Coventry. She disappeared with her mum on the 15th of August during a supervised visit. There haven't been any sightings of Mary or little Anna since. And police are now really worried about their welfare because, you see, Anna suffers from a severe medical condition. She needs to be monitored by doctors. We urgently need to find her.
Mary is from the travelling community. She's previously lived on sites in Coventry and is maybe being helped by family or friends. If you've seen them or if you know where they are, do the right thing. Call us now. It's time now for a behind-the-scenes look at how detectives in York solved the case of the so-called pasta poisoner. This is her. Her name is Heather Mook. She stole over £40,000 from her frail mother-in-law and tried to cover her tracks by poisoning her husband. She used a combination of drugs and rat poison hidden in his pasta. Matthew Amralawala takes up the story. John Mook was hallucinating. Robin Road, love. Don't worry, you have to put I remember saying to my son-in-law, I've got a bit of headache coming on. That's one pound ten. And I don't remember anything after that. Do not remember a thing. Mind the doors. And the next thing I remember is people flashing lights in my eyes. You, you just don't think that your wife will poison you. This is the story of Heather Mook, the woman who poisoned her husband. You've got the wrong bus, mate. You want the number 27. Sure, sure. Just calm down. Everything's going to be fine. Just take these down. Good. That's it. Just take them down. Yeah, swallow it down with that. That'll make you feel much better. What are you giving Dad? Well, the nurses are just so busy. They, they asked me to give your dad his medication. Why is she giving him his medication? I mean, that's your job. But John isn't on any medication. Shouldn't be taking any pills. It was that moment in a hospital in York that Heather was rumbled. Her stepdaughter caught her red-handed, slipping pills to her own sick husband. Tell me your reaction that moment when you saw Heather giving your dad those tablets. It was just a shock. Um, I just thought, this isn't right. Normally the nurses give the tablets. It was later on that day that the nurse had actually said that we had suspicions that she was trying to poison my dad. Poisoning is an extremely unusual and rare crime. This allegation posed a huge challenge to detectives. They needed to act quickly. But first, they had to get to grips with ancient laws on poisoning. These laws have been written hundreds of years ago. And there hasn't been many cases at court to obviously give us uh, examples and trials and case law which people can refer to. But police had no time to lose. If Heather was guilty, and they didn't arrest her straight away, there was every chance she might destroy the evidence and cover her tracks. The easiest option for us to arrest her for was at that time just a straight assault. We knew that she'd obviously given him something, or we suspected that she'd given something that affected his well-being, which is an assault. That was just to get us into her property, to get her here under questioning, so we could then start the investigation process. While police went after Heather, doctors tried to track down just what she'd given John. The answer was still coursing through his veins, a drug called amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is a drug which was originally introduced as an antidepressant. If you haven't been prescribed it and you're given it in large doses, then it has got a lot of side effects. When he went into hospital, he had had a life-threatening overdose of amitriptyline. He had taken enough to potentially end his life. Police searched the couple's home. Hidden around the house, stashes of amitriptyline. And concealed in a cool box, half a packet of rat poison. When Heather gave John the pills in hospital, he was already suffering the effects of a massive amitriptyline overdose. That's because John had also been poisoned the day before. John? The doctor phoned earlier this morning. He wants you to come in for a scan tomorrow because you've got to take these beforehand. Come on, swallow them down. Well, all nine of them. Well, that's what he says. Okay. Good. Don't work too hard. But John's doctor hadn't called, nor had he asked John to take any drugs. It was all an enormous hoax by Heather to get her husband to consume a massive dose of amitriptyline. But why? Heather's attitude uh, to any questions uh, posed to her was uh, no comment. She was asked about the reasons why she had poisoned John. No comment. And whether, in fact, she'd actually attempted to take his life. Again, she decided not to answer those questions. No comment. 
With Heather refusing to talk, police would have to find the answers for themselves. But to uncover the motive, they needed to pinpoint when the poisoning started. The clue was in John's hair. We took a sample of John Mook's hair and that was sent to a professor in Switzerland for him to analyse. Although drugs will leave the system through the blood and the urine, it will remain in hair for a number of, of weeks, months after um, the drug's been administered. Heather may have kept silent, but the hair on John's head spoke volumes. It revealed he had been poisoned with high doses of amitriptyline for months. Heather loved to cook for John. It was the perfect way to poison her husband. Her favourite ploy was to hide the poison in his pasta. Her signature dish, spaghetti bolognese, laced with amitriptyline and lashings of rat poison. just made me feel tired all the time, very drowsy, lethargic. What did you think was actually going on? Just overwork, just working a lot of hours. Never dreamt for a minute that she was, you know, putting pills in my food. You never thought for a moment no. your wife was behind it? No, not for a minute. You, you just don't think that your wife will poison you. But that's exactly what Heather had been doing, and still the question was why? The family's finances gave police their first clue. John's mother's nursing home bill was not being paid, and John didn't know why. We just thought we had a um, communication problem, that, that the money wasn't getting transferred. And when you talked to the nursing home, wh what did they say you owed to them? They told us we owed, I think it was £25,000, but it was going up, you know, to a grand total of thirty. I thought it had all been paid. Who was controlling the finances? Well, Heather was. You know, Heather had hold of my mum's banker card and a PIN number. As police continued to search the couple's home, they found financial documents stashed by Heather all over the house. They showed Heather had embezzled £43,000 of her mother-in-law's life savings. And further proof, a phone conversation recorded by the family's bank. During the call, Heather impersonates her own mother-in-law, faking an elderly voice. All this to steal thousands of pounds. So the money will be released when? Tomorrow. That's brilliant. OK, and I have a reference to give you now. OK. It's a long reference, just to warn you. Hang on a minute. OK. Uh, Heather, Heather, can you write this number down to me? Heather, Heather? I'm going to put my daughter-in-law on. Certainly. Good morning. Good morning. Hello there. Hi. Right. Uh, I'll just um, be able to provide you with the dealing reference right. now for the sale I've placed. It's A for Alpha. Yeah. That's the woman she was. She uh, She's planned this. Very callous. Uh, confidence trickster. It was now quite clear Heather's motive was to get her hands on her mother-in-law's money. But if there was still any doubt about that, it was blown away by what police discovered next. Now that we've got the financial angle, uh, we obviously focused our investigation into um, trying to see whether or not the dates when John became ill were significant. It wasn't random, was it? No. It was always when we were going to have a meeting with either A, the bank, or B, we're going to see the investment people. It was always when there was an appointment to get to the bottom of it. When it got to the stage that he was now finding out or was about to find out what was happening, she had to stop him and she went to the lengths of poisoning him. And anybody can do that. He's evil. Of course, yeah, of course I'm angry. And I'm bitter and I'm hurt. You know, really I'm hurt that she could do something like that to, to me to get her hands on some money, that she could endanger my life to that extent that she could have killed me. Had Heather Mook not been caught, it's very likely that her husband, John, would not be alive today. At the end of last year, she was jailed indefinitely. Bon appetit, right enough. Um, she had form, didn't she? 
She really did. She was quite some piece of work. She had a history of deception that spanned 30 years. I mean, the list of convictions, it's so long I've actually had to write them down. 1974 it started, obtaining property by deception, a similar thing in 78. A more sinister twist in 1982, she was convicted of poisoning her own seven-year-old daughter with antidepressants. She got a two-year probation order for that. 1983, she was convicted of conning her first husband out of money. She'd been married four times. A big one in 1991, jailed for three years for defrauding friends and neighbours of five million pounds. Oh, five million. I mean... And the list just goes on. The 40 grand on this occasion, what does she do with it? Well, she spent the money on herself. Uh, most of the money she spent this time on cosmetic surgery. She had a breast reduction operation. She told her husband she had breast cancer. She pretended to go to hospital for treatment. She even cut her own hair at night, and in the morning she would point to the pillow and say, look at the hair, it's falling out because of chemotherapy. She was addicted to money and addicted to lies. Her husband, what did you make of him? It was strange, you know, when I went up to interview, I fully expected to be much, much more angry. And when you sort of came away, you were trying to figure out why he wasn't, had he perhaps forgiven her, had right. he perhaps somewhere in there, a small part of him still had feelings for her. It was Im impossible to say. I mean, it's extraordinary if that's what it was, because after what she'd done, I yeah. mean, she'd come within an ace of actually killing him. And how long did she get? Well, it's one of those rare indeterminate sentences with a minimum of five years. Psychiatrists said she was bad, not mad. So after five years, they will assess her. If she is still a risk to the public, she's safe exactly where she is in prison. OK, thanks very much, Matthew. Now, here's Rav with what's been happening on the phones. And we have actually had some really, really good calls tonight. A massive reaction from you all at home on that poor, sickening burglary on 82-year-old Margaret up in St Helens. If you remember, this poor innocent lady was pushed over and died of her injuries just six days later. 41 calls so far on that, 26 names put forward, two of which are exactly the same of different people. Someone's also claimed to have information on her money pot that was stolen, so that's fantastic. Then very quickly, the pregnant woman that was attacked in Penge. We've got 21 good calls on that, seven names being put forward and one possible addressed, but sadly no news yet on her being in labour. OK, that's all for now. Details on all of tonight's cases are on the website bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Log on now for a live update on what's been happening right here on the phones tonight. And don't forget, you can also sign up online for our free newsletter each month. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight and from 7.30am tomorrow. Our next programme, well, that's on Wednesday the 19th of November. But don't go away because we're back after the news with a full update on what's come in on tonight's cases. It's been busy. If you can help but haven't called yet, please do it now. See you at 10.35. loved and revered as one of the world's greatest film directors. But tragedy and controversy would one day scar his life. His pregnant wife was brutally murdered, and years later he was charged with underage sex. He pleaded guilty but fled to France, where he remains, as far as the Americans are concerned, a fugitive from justice. Roman Polanski, Wanted and Desired, Storyville, over on BBC4 now. Now on BBC One, the BBC 10 o'clock news with Hugh Edwards and Riz Latif. Tonight at 10, it's all changed for the British banking system and the taxpayer foots the massive bill. 37.